Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Emily loved karaoke. She started singing as a child. As soon as a bear stepped on her ear, and an irresistible urge for singing flared up in her soul. But as she got older, Emily realized that only a tipsy audience at a sing-along bar could endure the power of her talent. Emily sang sincerely, soulfully, but very poorly. At school music lessons, she always got an A on automatic, as long as she didn't make any sounds with her mouth. The teacher was a conservatory graduate. She had a fine ear for music, so Emily's singing gave her unbearable agony. At school performances, Emily was only trusted to stand on the edge of the stage and at the sign of the conductor a couple of times to take the metal triangle, while the not slender chorus zone clearly pulled the refrain of a beautiful Dalek. One day, Emily's mother became indignant. How is that possible? Why does my daughter never get to sing at school performances? Finn as a lone shark music teacher gave in under pressure from her angry mother, and Emily entrusted her even the entire solo part. The girl wanted to surprise her mother, so she rehearsed when she was out of the house. And when at the school fireworks, she finally showed her talent in front of the whole class, sincerely did not understand why at the end of the hall fell down with laughter, and her mother's new face expresses a desire to catapult together with a chair somewhere in outer space. Here, they really had no hearing, no voice. But if her friends managed to get her into a bar where she could sing and drink, she immediately became the queen of the evening. No one could sing Alabama song as soulfully as Emily. It was her signature song. Usually everything happened according to the same scheme. Coming to karaoke with her friends, Emily sat modestly at the table, lowering her long eyelashes and every time she was invited to sing, she refused, although in her heart she longed for it. But after drinking a couple of cocktails and relaxing, she felt the urge to express her good mood by performing a solo number under the influence of alcohol. She thought she sang better than anyone else and danced like a goddess. In short, she had a fun evening, but in the morning she felt as if she had been run over by a tractor. Drinking mineral water and alcohol she found a video of the party on her phone, and she became quite sick, but from shame, not from a hangover. And each time, Emily vowed not to embarrass herself like that again. But later she would still go to a party and make sure she stepped on her favorite rake of karaoke bars. There were a few in town, and Emily avoided going to the same place twice in a row. At the very least, she tried to take a break, so that she would be forgotten there when her friends called her out. She always said categorically no to the idea at first. Then she would ask, where were they going? No, no, you can't go there. They had already disgraced themselves there, and they had never been there. Yeah, I guess that's okay, except she won't sing, period. But each time, the desire to prove herself was stronger and Emily felt like a pop star on stage again. Well, she loved karaoke, and every time she went there with great pleasure. That night, Emily had already managed to sing her traditional drink and with clear conscience was relaxing while savoring cocktail and listening to her friends singing a duet. Often when she was alone at the table, she was approached by men to get acquainted. This time too, she was approached, but not a man but a tall, bony girl in a shiny dress. She looked about 27, a few years younger than Emily. Excuse me, may I see you? She asked and smiled shyly. You may. At a loss, Emily nodded. My name is Kelly. She introduced herself. Emily introduced herself in response, and the new acquaintances asked if she wanted to sing a duet. Kelly complained that she had arranged to meet her friend and she came and the other one canceled at the last minute. Well, since she's already in the mood for fun, she'd like to join someone else's company, if Emily and her friend don't mind. Of course, you sang so soulfully. That's rare here. Usually everyone is trying to please the audience, making sure they hit the notes, and you just enjoy the process. That's so great, praised Emily. The new acquaintance seemed special and fun with fire, along with, 
Drunk Emily, they went to order a song, come on this one. Kelly asked the sound engineer and he, having picked the right tone for them, let the girls go on stage. I didn't think anybody could sing worse than her. But Kelly surpassed all her expectations. Together, they made a soulful do it and even asked the backing vocalist, who was trying not to spoil their performance, hugging each other like cronies. Kelly and Emily squealed like resentful cats who have been thrown by their master with a stool. Emily had never felt such complacent communion as she had with Kelly, not even with her own husband then. But this evening, Emily was not thinking of him, especially he was on another of his business trips, from which the woman is pretty tired, which takes its youth. She is 33 years old, of which she has been married for five years. There is a young son. He is now with his grandmother, her mother, but she hardly sees her husband. And that's a shame. That's what Emily told her newfound friend, sitting at a table and pulling up a martini. Kelly was sitting across the table from her chair with her chin under her arm. She listened intently, not missing a single word, and looked at Emily with eyes full of sympathy. That was the story of Kelly, to the point of tears. Patiently, this Emily great woman with genuine admiration, she said. Emily and her friends had long since gone home. Her mother called several times, unobtrusively wondering if her daughter was going to return to her own child. But she didn't respond to anyone. Today, she finally met the only person who understood her, did not judge her, and even admired her. To meet such a person in her life is a blessing. And it didn't matter what sex he was. There were fewer and fewer visitors, and the stage was more and more empty, so no one was stopping Emily and Kelly from having a good time. They hugged each other and sang the most heartfelt songs. And then Kelly treated Emily to another cocktail. Can I pay for you? Kelly asked, pressing her broad hand to her puffy chest so as to make it clear that her gesture was sincere and not of mercenary interest. You could call Emily graciously. Kelly gave her a drink, and together they poured out their woman's grief. After all, there is always something to grieve about if you want to. The newfound friends were ready to party till morning, but the workers politely informed them that it was closing time, and they took the drinks with them. The girls went for a walk in the city at night, continuing to party and sing songs in the street. At last, Emily remembered that she was, after all, a mother and also a daughter, so she could get in a lot of trouble, so she decided to go home. She foresaw the puzzle that awaited her at home. After all, her mother strongly disapproved of her daughter getting so drunk. But what could she do if she wanted to relax at least once every six months? Her friends called a cab. Where are you going? Asked a drunken Kelly. I'm going to Highway 52 7th Apartment, reported Emily. I'm going the other way. Then I'm not going with you. I'll get myself another car, said the girlfriend. Bye. It was nice meeting you. Emily smiled drunkenly. Bye, said Kelly, and hugged her goodbye and headed away, sparkling and in her silver dress. As the car drove away, Emily suddenly realized that they had not exchanged phone numbers with her friend. And now she may never see her. She was immediately struck by the deja vu of her childhood. When you meet someone in the sandbox, have fun, and then your mother takes you home, and you never see your new friend again. But that soon stopped bothering her because the woman's thoughts were then focused on not throwing up in the car. Fortunately, she arrived safely, quietly entered the apartment, afraid to wake up her mother. But she, as it turned out, was not asleep. Carried my daughter and came a walker, grumbled my mother. Oh, mom, not now. I'm drunk, begged Emily. Ah, you're also drunk well. You left the child on a binge and got drunk. The mother threw up her hands. Mom, but can I at least once a year to relax? Ah, incandescent Emily, like a little girl. Once a year, my mother asked me again. You have a corporate party, or a birthday party, or even a depression. But mom, and how often does that happen? At Christmas, and then in February and March. That's it. And what month is it now? June. Mom, June. 
Well then happy beginning, daughter with the opening, so to speak, the summer season in the bedroom do not go, no need to breathe on the child's breath. You lie on the couch, sternly ranted mother. Emily's legs became tangled. She tried to catch her balance, but it was a difficult task. Eventually reaching her sleeping place, she collapsed on the couch with what she was wearing and snorted loudly. Snoring was not normally Emily's thing, but after a binge, she could snore as loudly as if there was an elderly morsel in their house. Emily had a tense morning ahead of her. First, her son Harry jumped on top of her. Mommy, hooray, you're back. I missed you so much. Come on, hurry up. Emily, the five-year-old boy, was babbling. Have mercy. What is mercy? The son asked, puzzled. And it means a good smack on her cheeks by the heels, wickedly advised his grandmother. Laughing merrily, Harry began to scratch his mother's heels. Oh, yo, yo, yo. Stop it and baby, Emily pleaded. But it only served to annoy the boy. That's right, tickle her more, let him get up, or else he will lie around. Granny grumbled. Everyone in the pack just took Emily away and crawled off the couch. At first she sat on the floor, but then she decided to pull herself together so she wouldn't lose face in front of her son. Opa, she said proudly. Are you full height? It's not so easy to get upright when your head is pounding. It takes willpower. Wow, mommy, what a beautiful princess you are. Harry sang in admiration. Determined to check it, Emily went to the mirror. Oh, you are. No, I'm not a princess. The king obviously thought Emily from the mirror looked at her middle-aged blonde, who would do well to touch up the roots of yesterday's makeup, was picturesquely smeared. But the plush dressing in the medicine cabinet was as good as new. It was as if she'd slept and rested instead of Emily. Glancing at her watch, Emily realized that it was one o'clock in the afternoon guiltily, turning her gaze to her mother. She met her stern face. I'm sorry, Mama's out of breath. I won't do it again. Lazy Emily, you will. Breaking fatiguedly, waving a kitchen towel in the direction of his daughter. Here, Ben will come back. He'll tame you, tame you. Emily agreed. Ben was a strict and disciplined man. He gave his all to his work. And if he had a free minute, that is his family. It is not difficult to assume that the man had very few free minutes. Otherwise, he certainly would not have let his wife dance can-can in karaoke. And Emily wouldn't have been drawn to parties either. When Ben was at home, she wouldn't leave him, cherished and pampered. Her husband was to her the heart of the world. And now the woman blamed it on him for getting so drunk yesterday because of his perpetual business trips, she was suffering. Drinking a strong black coffee without sugar, Emily felt that her mind was gradually settling into order. Great, all that was left was to wash her face and all would be well. But no sooner had the woman visited the bathroom than the doorbell rang. Emily didn't move. In this state, she would not open to anyone. It was of no use to her anyway. The bell rang again, and Emily heard her mother angrily, muttering, go to find out who was visiting. Emily shouted after a minute she did, Edie and your drinking buddy are here. Emily raised her eyebrows. Who is it? Nancy, Kathy. She doesn't seem to have anyone else. Emily, come on, you're expected, hurried her mother with a heavy sigh. Emily got up from her stool and went into the corridor. There stood a lanky figure in a short dress, but in yellow instead of silver. Kelly was surprised and delighted at the same time, Emily, I'm so glad to see you. How did you find me? Wow, Emily. Without saying hello, Kelly replied. It wasn't hard to find you. You told me the address yourself yesterday when you called for a cab. But if you find out the reason for my visit, your joy will evaporate. Well, come on, let's go in the kitchen. Let's sit on the bench in the backyard. Quietly, quietly sit and talk, Kelly suggested. Okay, Emily agreed. You intrigued me. Let's go. You still haven't changed your clothes since yesterday. Surprise, Kelly. Oh, I could barely get up today, and I could barely drink my coffee. I'm not you. We drank together yesterday, and I'm the only one who's drunk. I'm not surprised. It's not like I was drinking. Kelly answered yesterday. 
I mean, we had so many drinks last night. Emily was surprised. Oh, let's go outside. I'll tell you all about it. Emily and the salt came out of the porch and went to the opposite side of the house. There was a bench and a table. Used to be when the local drunks were alive, this was their clearing. But one had been drinking and died of cirrhosis a year ago, the second had died of alcohol, and the third had died of boredom after losing his faithful comrades in arms. Anyway, the table was free, and Emily Salt sat down to have what Kelly said was an important conversation. So what happened? Emily asked. She sat down at the soon-to-be knotted and benched table, not sparing her plush dress, gathering more air in her lungs. Kelly, Emily blurted out, I'm pregnant by your husband. Emily's jaw dropped open automatically. Don't you hit me, Emily. Kelly pleaded as if she were faced with a big, big, big man instead of a frail woman. Seeing that Emily was numb with surprise, she continued. Then we started living together. I didn't know he was married, she explained. No, no, wait, Emily said. Are you pregnant with my husband, Vep? Yes, Kelly nodded. But it can't be. He's infertile. Confused, Emily muttered. Yes, it was a miracle. But you have a son too, don't you? Kelly reminded her. No, but our son is a true miracle. Ben, as a child, had a disease. He was barren until he met you. With a smirk, her companion finished for Emily. Emily, her eyelashes fluttered. How did you know that? I turned out to be much smarter than you, though not smart enough. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten pregnant by that scoundrel. It's so cynical to cheat and pretend to be such a family man. But that takes talent, said Kelly. Look, Kelly, I don't know what you mean. What do you want from me anyway? I don't believe my Ben slept with you. You're not even his type. He's a head shorter than you. You're a bobblehead. Going on the offensive, Emily. And I don't trust you at all. I don't know you. We just met last night. You drunkenly came on to me, found out all sorts of information about me, followed me around, and now you're telling tall tales. Yeah, I wasn't drunk. You're the one who's wigging out on the key, Kelly. I'm pregnant and I was drinking non-alcoholic cocktails. And if you don't believe me, look whose hand this is, pulling out her phone. Kelly showed Emily a picture of her holding a man's hand. The rest of the man was hiding somewhere behind the frame. I don't know whose hand it is, anyone's. Emily, I don't even know our struggles and crusts, asked Kelly. No categorically replied Emily. And just in case, turned away so as not to see this hairy arm, such a thicket on his arms. Indeed, not every man had one. Nevertheless, the furry paw could belong to anyone. Look, Kelly, don't you have any more visual evidence? Joint photos where there is a face, not just a hand. There are. It suddenly dawned on Emily. Imagine, I don't have a picture of Ben. Do you, Emily, have one? Kelly grinned. Emily opened her mouth and started smacking her lips like a fish. She had nothing to say to Kelly because she was right. She and her husband barely had any pictures together. How had that come about? Ben simply said he didn't like taking pictures and was always angry when Emily tried to take one. And if she occasionally managed to get a picture taken, Ben demanded it be deleted. The wedding photos from their humble wedding reception suddenly evaporated too. One day, Eventually, Emily just gave up trying to create a family album. Yeah, Kelly nodded understandingly. He doesn't like being photographed. We know. Let's do a morgue lineup, then, and list all the things he looks like. There's a birthmark on his neck, Emily nodded. There's also a scar on his shoulder blade. When he was a kid, a kid from the neighborhood threw a metal dart at him. Thought he'd missed. But in fact, he'd hit it. That's how Emily exhaled. He's also building a business here. When he's rich, we'll have everything in the world, everything. Kelly grinned. Yeah. Emily nodded and realized that this wasn't some kind of whimsy or fantasy of a casual acquaintance. This was the real situation. Her husband was cheating on her. She covered her face with her hands 
and took a deep breath. How could he? Emily asked herself, but said it out loud. Ashole. Kelly blurted out, taking her hands away from her face. Emily looked at her husband's mistress and asked how did you two meet? Does it really matter? Kelly snickered. To me it does, replied the cheating wife. On a dating site, Kelly shrugged her shoulders. What a bastard, said Emily. And how did you live together? We did. That's how we lived. I had a business trip with you. That is, I came and went like a sailor, a day at home, a year at sea. And you were all right with that. Emily was surprised. No, of course not. What could I do? He was so courteous. Flowers, presents at home. He repaired everything that was broken, nailed up a shelf. Kelly tried to justify herself. Yeah, the shelf was a big deal. Emily agreed. You could fall in love with something like that. And when you found out about me, you got a little suspicious. I have a friend who is a lawyer. She has access to the registry. They looked at who he was married to, where he was registered. Anyway, they found out about you. At first I wanted to make a scandal, and then I thought that you are just as deceived as I was, admitted Kelly. Well, thank you for being helpful, Emily grinned ironically. What shall we do now? Asked her rival. You can do what you want. Your life is not angry at you. You're just an ordinary fool, just like me. And I'll deal with this jerk and divorce him. I see. Well, good luck, Kelly sighed. You're funny, you're funny, and you're kind. It's a pity we met under these circumstances. We could have been friends, she said, and out of the chairs found her way along the trampled in path. And stop, Emily called out to her. Will you at least come in for a cup of tea? Don't tell my mother who you are. She thinks you're my drinking buddy. Well, let her keep thinking that. Kelly's supposedly happy face for a falcon in heels, which made her already considerable height even taller. Oh, Emily, you're so good, so soulful. Delightedly, she said, okay, you and I are friends in misfortune. Emily gasped and together they headed for the entrance. The minibus lazily rolled up to the lone bus stop in the village. Fat woman about 35 years old joyfully jumped up from the bench. Well, finally, what took so long? She asked the driver. My partner broke down. The driver shrugged his shoulders. I'm on my own today. Get in. The woman sat down in the front seat next to the driver. I will entertain you cheerfully, she said. That's all I need muttered the driver, and drive me carefully through our potholes. You see how big my belly is, the woman reported and pointed to her round belly. I see, I see that you are very pregnant, the driver sighed. I'm on my way to the regional center to see the maternity hospital and to have a checkup. I've been here, I haven't even had an ultrasound. At least I'll see what I have there, but I know all is well. It's going to be a boy, I'm sure. The driver listened tiredly to her story, forgetting his toothpicks and staring at one point on the road. Excuse me, the young girl in the back suddenly interrupted the passenger. I overheard you talking. It turns out that I am on my way to you. I'm from the neighboring village. It's kind of scary to go to the center by myself. May I join you? My name is Maria. She introduced herself. My name is Nancy. The woman turned around. Well, it's more fun together. I don't mind. An hour later, they arrived in the city, got out of the minibus, thanked the driver, but walked on. The friend said, good-natured Nancy, what are you there for? Pregnant, Maria sighed. I just didn't want to talk about it on the bus. My father doesn't know about it. We have a big farm and the meat, milk, cheese is delicious. We make a delicious cheese, like a pigtail. Nancy interrupted. Yes, yes. Maria nodded. A lot of people know us. I didn't want my dad to get the message. He would have taken me in the car, but I tricked him. I said I was going to a friend's house. I see. Well, shall we go then? You don't have much time, do you? Nancy asked. She just sighed. And the father of the child, that he is older than me, says the whole world at my feet. Soon he'll get a good deal on a business he's building, 
and we'll get on with our lives. We'll buy a house. Then it won't be a shame to ask my father for my hand. But right now it's better not to flaunt our relationship. Maria lowered her eyes. Well, don't be sad. Mine has the same story with all the money in the business. He comes to me pale and green and tired. I'd rather feed him milk to the casement. I keep a goat, feed it with cheese and vegetables from my own garden. He rests at my place in the fresh air. And then he goes back to fighting with his business sharks. Of course, I also get him some money. I got an inheritance so I can afford it. It makes me happy to be able to help him build a business. Here is mine in the business, smiled Maria. He knows my father, except that my father will not approve of us not getting married. Ben himself says that he wants first to solve the question of his career, and then he will ask my hand to Ben. It's a coincidence that mine is also Ben. Nancy grinned. Oh, how exciting. You and I are kindred spirits. Maria laughed. So they talked and got to the center. Well, we have an appointment with the doctors, don't we? Do you want to meet me at the reception? We'll go home together. Oh, I wanted to go for a walk. After the hospital, Maria smiled. Let's go for a walk, but not far from here. My legs are ticking, Nancy sighed. An hour later, they met at the reception. Nancy just dictated her data, which the girl in a green medical suit entered into the computer. Thank you, smiled the girl. And I was asked to leave my information, Nancy said. Maria, wait, so nodded the girl. Right, phone, yes right, dictating by the numbers. Father's name, then, yes, yes. Why are you looking at me like that? We're like two birds, a nightingale and a dove, Nancy laughed. Write down the telephone number. Nancy began to dictate the phone number and once again, Seeing the bewildered look on her face, the registrar irritably asked what in the world. She turned to her new friend with the intention to complain about the strange reaction of the girl at the reception, and what all the wrong thing to her last name was eyebrows. Now the phone to her is not, but when she saw Maria's face, Nancy immediately forgot about the hapless nurse and switched to the girl. What's the matter with you? Nancy asked. What about me? I just dictated her phone number. Stammering, Maria mumbled. Why? Nancy asked. Completely perplexed, they asked for the phone number of the child's father. I dictated it. Maria snapped. So you would have dictated your man's data. What are we doing with him? Couldn't figure it out, Nancy. Nancy, does the baby put pressure on your bladder? Maria asked. It does. Nancy nodded but I think that it presses on your brain. She blurted out and sat down in the nearest chair and put her hands over her face. Wait, wait. She thought slowly. Nancy, what is it? Are you saying your Ben is my Ben too? Yes, the girl is. Oh, you slut. Nancy screamed and made offensive moves toward the frightened girl who had become her enemy overnight. What are you doing? What is it? Scared Maria. So you decided to steal my finance. She found out that I have a promising guy. I have a lot of money. So she knocked him up quickly. Is that so? With anger, the woman's face turned red. She puffed out her cheeks and was ready to rush into battle like a bull. What are you? What are you? Nancy flew. Maria slowly got up from her chair and sideways, trying to crawl away. But suddenly she found herself against the wall. There was nowhere to retreat from her furious rival. Emily was moving on the unhappy girl with all her weight, like a merciless tsunami on the bread and fish hut. Nancy, forgive me, I had nothing to do with it. Maria pleaded. I didn't mean to get pregnant by him. He was infertile. He had a lot of illnesses as a child. And then Nancy, the miracle, froze like a stone. No, she said, confused. It was a miracle that happened to me. He had the mumps. And how did he meet me? How was my infertility cured? Behind her, I heard barely containing the laughter of the girl from the reception. Nancy turned around and barked, what do you want there, Belfry? To stay out of trouble. The girl crouched down, hiding behind the counter and continued to hold back laughter in her hiding place. Well, get the hell out of here and stay out of my sight. 
Nancy barked at Maria, and she galloped off toward the exit of the medical center. And you, said Nancy, turning to the girl at the front desk. Look for me in the file cabinet. Who else has left my husband's phone number here? I'm sorry, I have to tell you no, the girl said seriously. I can't give out confidential information. Well, quickly, tell me who else my Ben impregnated, or I'll start giving birth, and I'll make you look guilty. Nancy threatened, but I can't. Flipped through the registry, I'm waiting for a breakthrough. Hello, woman. With a sigh, the girl typed the phone number into the computer and found Kelly. Ah, ah, Kelly. Well, Kelly, now the scraps will fly through the streets. Give me her address. No, that's out of the question. I'll call security. The employee hustled. Then the phone and her firmly demanded Nancy. After a brief bickering girl still gave the phone Kelly. That's me just do not give out. She squealed pitifully. Don't worry, I won't. She promised Nancy and after paying off her huge belly, resolutely headed for the exit. Kelly was just drinking her second cup of strong tea and sitting in the kitchen, Emily, when suddenly her phone vibrated. Hello? Yes, I'm Kelly. Yes. Ben. Unfortunately, I know. Well, all right, come over. Here's the address, said Kelly, telling Emily the house and the apartment. What was that? Emily asked. Hold on. Kelly replied. I think there's another one on its way. She's about to have a showdown. No. You're so pretty, you gave me your address. But what if she's inadequate? Her eyes are rounded. Emily on the phone is normal in life, I do not know what. But don't worry, she's coming to talk to me, not to you. Kelly reassured her friend in distress. I'll at least go clean myself up, Emily said as she went to the bathroom. She finally washed her face and removed yesterday's makeup. What quality cosmetics? Mascara. How hard it is to wash off. Emily? Shouted Kelly from the kitchen. She had lived with a rival for a couple of hours and felt right at home. Are you sure you don't want to use our phone? Emily didn't answer. There's nothing to disturb a busy person. And anyway, I don't want to lose the pleasure of looking him in the eye in person when I report what I know about everything. The doorbell rang. Mother, I'll get it. Shouted Emily. No sooner had Emily opened the door than a pudgy Nancy rolled into the apartment. So there you are, Kelly said Nancy right from the doorstep. You were wrong. Emily shook her head. Kelly, there's a woman came forward. Hello, she said. Wow, you're so long. Nancy marveled. Is that how he got on top of you? Interesting. No vulgarity, shouted Emily's mother. We have children here. Let's go into the kitchen. Emily invited, anticipating an entertaining dialogue. Would you like some tea? I don't want your tea, Nancy muttered. We'll get you some. Here's some sweets and cookies for you, Emily smiled. How hospitable you are. Do you know what your friend is? Nancy began, pointing her finger at Kelly. She stole my husband. How horrible. Emily fluttered her arms, pretending to be surprised. That's right. She stole my man and got me pregnant. Nancy complained. Are you talking about me? Kelly raised her eyebrows. About you? Who else? Nancy snarled angrily. So are you pregnant with my Ben too? With a casual tone, Emily inquired. What do you mean with yours? Nancy was surprised. And that's how Kelly smirked. He's her husband, Emily. And they're married, by the way. Yeah, said Emily. I can show you the marriage certificate. The wedding pictures, alas, have been lost. What more proof do you need? Nancy hovered briefly, like a poorly written program. Then she woke up and said, bring it all. I do not believe it. 10 minutes later, she was sobbing, dropping her head on her folded arms on the table. And he could be a jerk. I did everything for him and I gave him money. Reread the woman. Come on, Nancy, calm down. Emily consoled her. You shouldn't be so nervous. It's not good for the baby. I wanted to open my own business, a small one, but my own. The woman wouldn't let up. What business? 
Kelly inquired, to distract the beluga's beluga-like guest. Suddenly, Nancy perked up. Organic. Wow, Emily was surprised. Yeah, transported the new ribbon even wanted to buy. I thought Ben would help. Emily poured Nancy a cup of tea and sat down next to her. Come on, Nancy. Tell me about it. How you met. How did it all work out? That's not how Nancy put it. I met on a dating site. I came here, we started living together. Seemed like a smart guy with hands. He's got a business deal coming up. True, he is away on business trips a lot. And now money is hard to come by. I even have to lend him money. But is it a pity for the man she loves? You have to support her. That's why she's a woman. They don't have such intelligent men in their village. This one's as different from them as heaven is from earth. Nancy, of course, hoped he'd help with the garden all the time. But Boris has urgent business trips, so he's no help. One disappointment. The doorbell rang again. The women looked at each other. Emily did not have time to get up from her seat as her mother literally in two jumps reached the front door and opened it, met her gaze with a young stranger. Hello, I am pregnant by your husband. She blurted out. Hello, my husband died 10 years ago. I am very sorry that you still have not divorced, clearly said Emily to her mother and was about to slam the door in front of the guest. Mom it to me, said Emily and smiled at the girl in a friendly way. Come on in, develop yourselves. What's going on here? Grudgingly muttered mother. All something pregnant, nervous. Oh, mother then said Emily and invited the girl into the kitchen. Oh, an old acquaintance, snickered Nancy. Seeing Maria, I would still argue. Which one of us is old? Maria looked at Nancy expressively. Look how she sang, and you seemed so modest. I wonder, how did you find us here? Nancy asked. It was easy. Maria shrugged. You were shouting so loudly in the courtyard of the medical center when you were on the phone. I was in no hurry to leave. I hid in the yard. But I heard some useful information. I decided to go and see for myself. Oh, girls, wouldn't you all be pregnant? I'd offer you a drink. But since you cannot, I poured myself a cognac, said Emily and reached for the decanter. Drinking again, her mother's voice came from behind her, so unexpected that she almost dropped the decanter. Go into the hall with your girlfriends. I have a child to prepare dinner. It's crowded here. The woman entered the kitchen and Harry modestly followed her. Confused by so many unfamiliar women who simultaneously stared at the boy and his wife, Nancy asked, nodding toward the boy. Doesn't he look it? Emily asked. He looks just like him. Kelly sighed. The women went to the big room, where they spread out, but a roomy corner couch and continued the conversation. Emily took a seat between Nancy and Maria, just in case. They wouldn't want to get into each other's hair again. Maria began to tell the story in a cliched voice. She and Ben met on the website. At first young Maria did not pay any attention to the older man. She responded more out of politeness. But as they conversed, she realized he was a very interesting person and felt her delicate soul. He told her about cinema, opera, and art in general in an interesting way. He also had a good understanding of scientific progress. Whatever you ask him, he knows everything. And I'm smart with Google too. Kelly waved her hand. Don't interrupt. Emily made a remark. And so Ben came to Maria's farm to meet his father. He didn't approve of the older groom, of course, but they sat down together and had a drink. And Ben quickly found a key to the heart of his future father-in-law. A few such dates, and the man even gave the future son-in-law some money for the business. He had a great story to tell. You can't get it wrong. If you get back on your feet, I'll marry my daughter to you, the farmer promised. Maria was happy. She had such a wonderful fiancé. It's just a pity that he had infertility as a child. Not surprisingly, Maria's sudden pregnancy came as a surprise to both of them. Upon learning the news, Ben Maria literally carried her in his arms and then left on another business trip, promising that after this business trip, they would definitely have a lot of money. 
She hadn't seen him since. Maria realized now that she would never have any money or happiness in the family. She didn't need the money either. Her father provided, and she wanted, so to speak, a big and clean one, like V Film. Yes, Johnny, I want a montage, so you can have money and a happy life right away, sighed Emily. To twist a quote from an old comedy girls, we have to get back at him, firmly said Kelly for all of us. But how did Maria get her nose kicked out? I have a buddy of mine hacker, will try to pick the password of our producer's account on a dating site. I'm going to meet him tomorrow. If all goes well, I'll see him the day after tomorrow here at Emily's. We'll read his correspondence. Seriously. I'm going to have a party again. She raised her eyebrows. Emily's inviting everyone to my house. Well, you're the wife in charge. Kelly smiled and patted Emily on the shoulder in a conciliatory way. Okay, the day after tomorrow at my place, can you grab something for tea? She hinted. And no, said Nancy. I can't go back and forth. I get shaky on the road. What am I supposed to do? Kelly puzzled. Well, if you want to stay with me, Emily suggested. That's fine. Nancy didn't hesitate. Who's going to milk the goat and feed the hens? Maria asked smugly. I'll call a neighbor and they'll feed me. Nancy found. Then I'll stay. Maria crossed her arms across her chest. If she can, then I can too. The girls laughed Emily. Do you really think Ben will come here? Do you want to wait for him? I don't expect him back in two weeks. And yet, we said it best here. The girls ended up escorting only Kelly, standing with her in the hallway while the guest was being trained. Emily asked you to hurry your hacker. I'm here with these two until the day after tomorrow. I'll try to solve the problem before tomorrow. Kelly nodded understandingly. When Emily returned to her guests, she said, Come on, girls, let's go in the kitchen and I'll feed you. She poured them her mother's borscht, put the stew, potatoes and cabbage, and cut the bread. Eat up, she said. And you asked Nancy. And I do not have a piece in my throat, said Emily and went to his mother. Mama, the girls are going to stay the night. She asked, Emily, I just want to ask you one thing. Are you adequate? Said the mother, looking at her daughter through her glasses. Mom, I can explain later. Emily pleaded. You do not have to explain anything to me. I've heard everything. Ben has taken mistresses of all fertility, and now his harem will live with us. No, Mom, come on. It's just for one night, Emily begged. Well, do as you please. Harry and I will be in my room and you do what you want," said the mother and defiantly took Harry by the hand and dragged him into the room with her. Emily set up the couch in the living room and made the bed. Will you girls sleep together? Just don't fight, insistently said Emily, give you at night ears. Well, and you have to brush your teeth with your finger. After giving out instructions, Emily went to bed. From the bedroom, she could hear the whispering of the overnight guests you could hear them arguing about something, just do not kill each other. At least not in my house, Emily thought, and drifted off to sleep. In the morning, she awoke to the delicious smell of high female voices coming from the kitchen, among which she recognized her mother's voice. Emily got up and headed for the kitchen. What's going on? She asked. Nothing, we'll cook for you tomorrow, Nancy replied. There were hot pancakes and jam on the table, which Harry was already hunting for. There was also a freshly baked charlotte on the table, which smelled of apples and cinnamon. Well, for once in my life, they freed me from making breakfast. In fact, Emily's mother muttered, sit down, Emily, I'll make you some coffee. Nancy's nun got the coffee ready. Aha, so the girls made up. That's good, Emily thought. Less problems. We need a cohesive team. No sooner had Emily had breakfast and cleaned up, so the doorbell rang. It was Kelly. She was wearing a bright short dress again, this time in green. In her hands she held a small laptop computer. Closer Emily said cheerfully. Overnight the hackers and I managed to hack into both our Ben's email and the dating site. I've already read some of it myself. My hair is on end. But still, 
I want to share this moment with you. 4. The women sat down on the couch. Emily's mother wanted to join them, but Emily asked her to take care of her grandson while they investigated. And I told you right off the bat he didn't whip you. The rascal didn't listen to her mother. And there you have it, muttered mother, and went to pack Harry for a walk. Mom, you said just yesterday that Ben had to put me down, and in general that he's good, and I'm a naughty girl. That's not my mother-in-law. Why the change of heart? Oh, come on. My mother waved her hand and proudly walked away. Okay, girls, sighed Emily. Let's see what the fighter did. Kelly opened her laptop and logged into Ben's account. Oh, how many correspondences? Counted a few. Yeah. So the con man was following the same pattern. First, he told the girl some unremarkable compliment to stand out in the crowd of those who were writing. He might even send her a poem. Then I started a relaxed conversation, was polite, tactfully demonstrated my erudition and erudition. That's how the dialogues were shown to the girls. He was interesting. I recognized the handwriting, sighed Kelly. So did I, Maria confessed. Well, Nancy confined herself to a deep sigh. Everything about her is clear. Among the dialogues, the girls found their own, but decided not to open them in front of each other. Awkward is a shame, but read other people's with pleasure. Of course, to figure out who Ben ended up going out with and who he didn't, it was very difficult. As a rule, the dialogue was cut short at the point where the couple exchanged phone numbers. But now the Avengers had his girlfriend's phone numbers. I'd have to call everyone, Kelly sighed. There's so many of them. Come on, you guys, Maria protested. No, we're gonna look, we're gonna call. We have to find all his victims. And I really want to find the one he's with now, to spoil him, said Emily. Her friends sighed together. It was going to be a long day. They took the phones in their hands and distributed among themselves the mistresses of her husband. Who and whom to call? They began dialing. Molly stood at the open window, enjoying the sunlight caressing her face. At last she was happy, taking a deep breath of fresh, warm air into her lungs. She almost screamed into the street. I'm happy. After getting her coffee and placing the cup on the windowsill, she closed the window of the apartment she had recently bought with her own money. She had everything a career, a good income, self-actualization, and more recently, love too. Molly's mother lamented the fact that her daughter at 35 is still single. Molly's career is good, but you also need a man. Kids around family, that's what's most important. Molly was a seasoned businesswoman who owned a beauty salon. And she started with just a coin table, set in a small room of her mother's apartment. Then she decided to expand services and gradually grew into her own salon. The city favors those who strive to earn money, so Molly was able to make a difference here. True, and she had to plow almost 24 hours a day, sacrificing sleep, rest, and privacy. But now, at 35, she could say that she had achieved a lot. But despite the success in her career, Molly felt a void in her soul. She was always something missing. She did not feel whole. Fortunately, the feeling passed. When she met Ben attractive, sensible knows what she wants and what compliments he gives her and advice unobtrusively and tells her what to do best. He has a hard time with finances and all the money is in business. Molly, I really like you. In fact, I love you but we cannot be together, said Ben. When Molly had already fallen deeply in love with him. How so? Why was the woman upset? Because now I am not worthy of your hand. You know, my business is about to start. I'll get good money. Then I can provide for you and feel confident. Ben answered firmly. But you know, I don't need money. I am perfectly capable of providing for myself. Molly tried to change his mind. No, dear. I won't feel like a man if I can't provide for my own woman. Ben frowned. Ben, can't I do something to make your business more successful? It dawned on Molly. What do you mean? Clarified Ben. Look, you say you have a deal to make. But meanwhile, there's something that's holding you back. Right? 
Maybe there are some factors that can help speed things up in business. Molly asked. Look, Molly, dear, yes, of course there are factors. But you have to understand that I will not agree to your help, otherwise I will not feel like a man, patiently explained Ben. I've paid, I won't feel like a man. And what will it be like for you to realize that the loved one, a woman suffers without you, that she does not sleep at night, crying shmig to the moon. Molly, even so, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. Ben lowered his eyes. There you are. The woman went on with a tear. So tell me, how can I help you? And without making me suffer, Ben swallowed his thick dark hair and looked Molly in the eye and blurted out I need $20,000. That's all the money is. Molly raised an eyebrow. It's so trivial, Ben shrugged. If I have the money, I can give it to my partner. He'll buy the equipment and things will go faster. Oh, I wish I'd known it was that easy. Honey, if it comes down to money, I'll give it to you. And don't say you're uncomfortable. You should be glad you're making me happy. Ben hugged Molly and with feeling and tearfulness said Molly, you are an incredible woman, holy, ordinary, just loving. Molly smiled graciously. Molly glowed, remembering this heartwarming scene, turning her gaze to the clock. She noted that it had been four hours since Ben promised to return. He had been staying with Molly the whole time. He agreed after much persuasion. He wasn't from around here himself, so he stayed in a hotel. But Molly moved him back to her place. But he went out every day on business. What exactly was he doing? Didn't say. The woman put a bucket of ice and champagne on the table, put out a vase of fruit, strawberries. She put out candy, three kinds of sliced cheese. The doorbell rang. It must have been Ben who came in early, and she didn't have time to fix her makeup. And she wanted to meet him in a dress, not a robe, even if it was pretty. She was going to do such an important thing, to give him money for the business. It should be celebrated. After that, they're going to start a new life. There's nothing to do. Have to meet the man I love in a robe. Coming, coming playfully, shouted Molly. Opening the door, she stunned. The smile flew from her face. Who are you? She asked without saying hello or introducing herself. Four women, one of whom was clearly in her final stages of pregnancy. They walked into Mola's newly renovated apartment. Yes, Nancy stretched out. Not a bad place our weepy had settled down. Not a bad crib was present Kelly. Who are you people? Outraged Molly. I'll call the police. We're all Ben's wives civilians. And here she is officially told Nancy and pushed Emily forward. Yeah, I was the luckiest of all, Emily said sarcastically. What are you talking about? Molly was perplexed. Here is the marriage certificate. Emily sighed, handing the landlady the document. Molly studied the paper and sat down at a loss on the first available surface, which turned out to be a banquet in the hallway. Yes, we were shocked ourselves. With sympathy, said Maria. And you? Are you pregnant with this child? Molly asked confused, pointing her finger at Nancy's belly from him. Nancy nodded affirmatively, stroking her belly with her hand. What a horror of an owl, Molly. I'll tell you more than that. He got us all pregnant, laughed Nancy. As Molly fluttered her arms, everyone ouch, except me, raised her hand Emily, as if she was in high school in class. I gave birth to him five years ago. Wait, but how can that be? I mean, he had it when he was a kid. Chorus finished for Molly uninterviewed guests. Yes, it's a long time ago. Molly read this, said Kelly, opening the laptop in front of the unhappy woman. It's not just you he's deceiving. We've already talked to some of his victims. He has affairs, finds women to impregnate them because they are more compliant and they believe that they were able to work a miracle for the free man, and now he will carry them in his arms, but he just rips them off. But the interesting thing is that we found this list of women and the amount next to it. Molly, $20,000. Does that mean anything to you? Where did you find this information? Molly was surprised. 
In the drafts in his mailbox was that where he kept his secret records. Kelly answered. Yes, Molly sighed. That's the amount of money I promised to give him for business today. So that's 20,000 bucks. Somebody's got money that comes with the birth of a child. We've talked to people like that too. He asks a woman to be a single mother. She gets help from the state and he takes the money away from her, said Nancy, who has already had time to sit down at the set table and was eating with gusto. Aha, he's got chicks in different cities and he's riding around. Maria poked Maria, but there's Kelly, the old lady who lives in the same city. Apparently, he let his guard down. Where do you even live? The coolest? We took the train to get here. Nancy had a stomach ache. We didn't think we'd make it. Why not? No one called the police. Molly interrupted her, because our women are kind. He'll cry and say he's in trouble, that debt collectors are looking for him, or something else they spit. They forgive her. What? She didn't believe me. At first, I believed you nice ladies, but now I see the truth. Tell me. There'll be no getting away with it. I'm a fool for a lesson, Molly sighed. And then there was the sound of the faithful bell in the apartment. It was he said, Molly. Hurry up and hide, she commanded. Kelly, come on. Stop chewing. Nancy when a bunch of women rushed into the next room with excitement, bunching together and nodding to one another. Hello, sweetheart. They heard the voice of their mutual husband. Hi, honey. Molly answered as if nothing had happened. What a table you made for us. The man was happy. We are having a feast, of course, the woman answered. Because today I want to give you something. What is interesting? Ben asked playfully, realizing that it was money. Oh, and what? What will take our relationship to the next level? Molly smiled. I can't imagine what it could be, the man muttered. That's what Molly said and handed Ben his own marriage certificate. What? What is it? The man was taken aback. Should I be asking you that, Ben? That you are married? Have you been cheating on me? Ben sighed heavily in response. Sit down, honey. I'll explain everything to you. He said, inviting Molly to the sofa. Do you understand? He continued as they sat down. I'm married, but I can't get a divorce. Why not? Molly asked. My wife is deeply disabled. After an accident, she left me for a lover, and soon she was hit by a car. We didn't even have time to get a divorce. She was left paralyzed. Naturally, her lover left her, refused to change her diapers, and I couldn't leave her, though I resented her. I took care of her. I try to relieve her suffering as much as I can. Here she is. The truth, Molly. Smoothly lying blurted out Emily, abruptly opening the door of the room where she hid with the other wives. Emily. Ben jumped up on the spot. Did you heal, Emily? Yep, healed. How's your infertility? Barked Emily. Emily, I'll explain everything to you. Ben started babbling. Yeah, explain it to me too. Demanded Nancy rolled out the door with her stomach. And I'd like an explanation, too, said Kelly walking out of the room. And Maria announced to me with the appearance of each of her wives. Ben was blushing, turning more and more pale. Suddenly he snapped out of his seat and grabbed the envelope of money that was on the table beside the champagne and rushed out of the apartment away after him. Girls, Kelly yelled. The women rushed to the front door in a mass, but Nancy's high-pitched screams stopped them. I think my water just broke, girls. Your water broke. Surprised Emily. It's early because 38 weeks may well be. Just took away a frightened Nancy. We have to get her to the hospital. Molly commanded. I'll get my car and I'll take her. And you guys go shopping. She needs a toothbrush, slippers. What does the maternity ward need? They'll give her something small, something she needs. I know Emily said, forgetting about the runaway vet. The women went shopping and then they circled around the maternity hospital for a long time, until Nancy called them and announced that she was having a boy. If full term was coming, he wouldn't even come out. Kelly laughed. 
The women hugged and cried. Yes, Ben could be forgiven for happiness like that. Girls, stay at my place tonight, Molly suggested. We'll have some champagne. We'll celebrate the baby's birth. We can't. Maria sighed and pointed at Kelly. But we can stay the night. I'm allowed to have a drink, so I'm in favor of champagne, Emily said. Throughout the night, the deceived women talked, telling personal stories and complaining about their fate. They decided they needed to punish Ben, only how to do it. Meanwhile, the fugitive was sitting in the car of his business partner, who looked more like a common fuck. Here I brought some more money, Ben said. The brother opened the envelope and counted the money. Not much, he said. Just this much so far. Ben couldn't tell the bandit that all the other women refused to give money after his wives called. When are the others? Asked the bandit. I'll get the money. Ben, look, if you don't bring our business, the partners will bury you. We owe them money we promised. And you have to keep your word, he said. Ben lowered his eyes and sighed heavily. What do you know that you won't find the money? Asked bro. I guess so, Ben stretched out. When that's my advice to you. I didn't see you. You didn't see me. Run wherever you can, but get as far away from here as you can. They'll find you. They'll lock you up. Don't touch the money. I won't give it back to you with empty pockets, full of fear for their lives. Ben wandered around town at first, tired of being homeless. He went to Emily's house after all. He begged his wife to forgive him, to lay at his feet, but she was cold and adamant. Emily, honey, they're going to kill me. And I'm a father of many children. Ben was making up arguments as he went along. Okay, now the house is on fire, your house is on fire. Maybe we'll think of something, said Emily, and slammed the door in front of Vep's nose with the caller's newfound friends, with whom she had become especially close after they all crowded together to see Nancy off to give birth and met her from the maternity hospital. Emily, in a collective video of happiness, asked Granny what we're going to do with our Sheik. I don't want him, Molly said. In general, I do not trust men anymore. You shouldn't have said that, Emily. You can't do that. There are good men out there. And you, Olga, what do you say? Thanks, but no. I'll get the baby back on his feet. But I won't tell you who the father is. Well, Emily was wrong to say that. You should file for child support. What kind of alimony? Kelly snorted. It's nothing more than a problem. What about you, Maria? What do you say? What do you girls say? Father said he'd get the shotgun. If that crook ever came near our house again, he wanted to turn him in to the police. But I talked him out of it. All right, girls, Nancy said firmly. I'll take him in for re-education. Maybe I'll make a man out of him. Let him come. And Ben came to Nancy quiet as silk to see the boy too. A son, after all. Shyly, he muttered. Not yet. Nancy said firmly, and I won't let him in the house. You'll live in the barn, so you'll work in the garden and help me with the fertilizer. You took a lot of money from me, and I already have my garage is not a factory to open. I was going to buy a conveyor belt wanted to buy. Well, nothing. Then you'll work by hand with organics and bring manure. Will you also take away? Ben obediently listened to orders. From that day on, his amazing life began. He both dug and planted and fiddled with the manure, and was grateful. He was very Nancy, though she could keep him warm at times, but still a woman. She was kind, soulful. Ben did not go out anymore, became about a husband, and was only sad about the fact that the woman who miraculously got pregnant by him did not want to show him her offspring. Well, it took Emily six months to come away from everything that had happened and realize that she now had a new free life. She divorced Ben and was very worried how Harry would take it. But the boy endured his parents' divorce calmly. After all, Ben did not take care of him before, and they rarely saw each other. Emily did not want to get acquainted with men, but one day she went to karaoke just where she had not quarreled for a long time. Kelly couldn't keep her company anymore. Too bad. The two of them sang so well together back then. 
she had to take her two bachelor girlfriends with her. So after Emily sang her favorite Alabama song while her friends were playing country music on the stage, two men came up to her. One of them was a Norwegian foreigner who came as an exchange student to an international company. He really liked the way Emily sang, but he didn't know English, so he asked his friend to meet the pretty girl. The young man's name was Eric. Emily really liked him, and it was mutual. After an unexpected acquaintance, it was as if Emily woke up from a dream, realizing that before she did not live, but existed and did not think about it for a long time. When Eric invited her to live with him in Norway, she accepted without hesitation. Harry moved too, and was very happy with how her new husband took care of her stepson. And her mother refused to leave, said she might move later. Well, in the meantime, she wants to live for herself with her ex-husband's wives. Emily hasn't stopped communicating. Told them how wonderful it was to live in the mountains, that the clearest water came to her house directly from the mountain glaciers. She showed them the magnificent nature, told them about Norwegian cuisine, and showed them her beautiful home. She told them that she was looking forward to visiting them all. And only one question remained open for Emily. Had they done the right thing by Ben? Was it fair, or should they have turned him into the police? When she talked to her friends about it, they usually had different opinions. After all, our women are not bloodthirsty. They know how to forgive even those who should not be forgiven. As for the women deceived by Ben, their fate was different. But that's another story.